What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Triangle Strategy, a story-heavy TRPG that released for the Switch back in March, however recently saw a release on PC, specifically Steam, which is where I am checking it out at. Now to get the usual stuff out of the way, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on YouTube. And while that does include the achievements, it also includes a lot more, though in the case of Triangle Strategy, the achievement list is incredibly thorough. But if you're interested in everything else I cover and you're not already subscribed, if you go to my channel, first video you'll see is a video explaining all of it. But with that out of the way, let's actually dive into this thing. Triangle Strategy has a pretty unique style to it, of course, the sort of HD 2D graphics, I believe it's called, that we see on display here. And no surprise there, really, as this is from the same people that worked on Bravely Default, as well as Octo. Path Traveler, which have a very similar graphical style. But broadly speaking, what Triangle Strategy really is, is a TRPG that meets a narrative game. So there's a lot of tactical based combat. However, it's not really the focus most of the time. This game has a very heavy emphasis on the story. And a lot of the combat oriented stuff really doesn't open up until you get into subsequent playthroughs, which we'll get into in just a moment. But first, let's talk a story setup. I'm not going to go really into spoilers here. However, I do want to cover kind of the basics of the plot setup. Our main character, though we will be playing as many of them in the combat sections, is Sarah Noah, set to be married off to a rival nation's other noble house, really, to cement cooperation between the two nations, that kind of thing, because we are in the nation of Glenbrook. However, there are two other nations, and all three of these nations were at war 30 years prior to the beginning of the game in a conflict that was centered around resources. But our character, Character Sarah Noah, due to his father's failing health, takes up his father's mantle as the lord of a certain area of Glenbrook, and you answer to a king that presides over the entire country, if you will. But as you might imagine, the peace that has found the three nations doesn't exactly last long, otherwise we wouldn't have much of a story to tell, and you have to work away through this conflict while making the best decisions as you can, which brings me to the paths through the game. There are three main paths through the game, however, there is an ending that you can only get if you take specific actions throughout the story, which is considered the true ending, you'll hear it referred to as the golden route sometimes. However, if all you have had to do was make those decisions, it would probably be pretty easy, but rather the game, at least on the first playthrough, requires these decisions to be made through voting. Every time there's a major choice to be made, you and the closest companions in your retinue will all vote on it, and you'll have to persuade these characters to vote your way, which works off of the conviction system. The conviction system is largely hidden on your first playthrough, however, on subsequent playthroughs in New Game Plus, the game will actually tell you what's what, but on your first run, you're not going to know anything about what's going on. Based on how you talk to people and actions you perform, you'll accumulate points in three different convictions, morality, utility, and liberty. And your ability to persuade the companions that you have is down to your actual morality score as well as picking the appropriate options. But again, all of that is hidden from you on your first playthrough, which means that first playthrough you might get saddled with a choice or two that's not really up to you because you get voted against, which can be a bit of a bummer when it happens, though this is a thing that New Game Plus pretty much completely alleviates because at that point your values in each of those scores is so high that you can basically persuade anyone to do what you want in terms of the vote. However, the first playthrough is a very tightly controlled experience through this system. And it goes even a little farther than that because it actually bleeds into the progression systems as well. There are a ton of optional characters throughout the game that you'll only get if you meet certain conviction thresholds or pick specific paths through the game. So in order to recruit every character possible, you're going to have to go through all of the different paths of the game. And by the time you do that, your scores should be more than high enough to get the rest of the companions. But again, not something you'll be able to do on your first run. However, even then, each and every one of those characters has a few different upgrade routes, promotions as well as their weapons, and these require materials that the game very tightly controls on your first playthrough, so you'll only be able to promote and strengthen a handful of units. Which brings me to one of my first major points for this game that we'll talk about a little bit later, but all of this kind of combines into a system that doesn't really feel like it opens up properly, especially on the combat side of things, until you've played through the game at least once. Which I think could be a little off-putting for a lot of people who are only going to play through a game the one time. 
But from there, let's talk about progression a little bit. As I mentioned, there are promotions and weapons. Promotions are basically pretty simple. Every character has two promotions they can eventually get to a veteran and elite version of whatever their class is. This requires them to be a certain level, as well as have the appropriate medal, which allows them to be promoted. These promotions come with base increases to their stats, making them more effective, but it also grants them more tactical points, or TP, and these are the resources that are used to power their abilities, and managing them is a decent part of combat if you expect to actually use your abilities regularly, and when they get promoted, they have more of them. We also have weapons. This is, of course, going to give us things like more damage, that type of stuff. But you use materials to increase these, things like stone, timber, that type of stuff. You also need special materials to upgrade your weapon tier, which will then allow you to pick up passive things to further increase your character's stats. And then, last but not least, in addition to... All of this stuff, there is a vendor, which you'll be buying a lot of your materials from, especially your promotion upgrade materials, called the Sundry Shop. The Sundry Shop also sells what are called quietuses, which is a weird word. But these are effects you can use in combat as the player. You can open up a menu and then click on quietus and then use it, and it'll have some bigger effect than normal. You can use a certain amount of these per combat as well, and these are bigger abilities that can absolutely change the flow of combat. Though again, on a first run, you're likely not going to be using it very much. Now that we've talked about the basic systems. I did want to mention, though, that each character has a relatively limited progression. If it sounded like what I was saying was a lot, it really isn't. It's two promotions which require an item and a basic level up, as well as upgrading their weapons all the way up. Most of this is passive stuff that you'll just kind of do as you play the game a little more, and it really just results in more damage being done. So it's a relatively simple system as far as progression goes, but the resources around it are tightly controlled. However, in addition to this, the character Characters themselves are also kind of bound to one role. You will get a ton of characters. There are roughly 30 or so, and each one of them has a pretty set role. They have set abilities, set promotions, that type of stuff. So that character is really only going to be able to do the one thing that they were designed to do. There is some overlap here, like you'll get a couple different kinds of mages, a couple different kinds of healers. Some of them will have a horse. Some of them will have the ability to use an item twice or be able to attack twice, stuff like that. So there's a little bit of variation on the individual characters, but they all have a set role. Next up, I want to talk about New Game Plus a little bit before we dive into the overall gameplay loop. And I want to start this with New Game Plus because this is where the game actually opens up, especially in terms of the combat in particular. As I've mentioned several times up to this point, the focus of the first run of the game is a very tightly controlled experience, and there's not a lot of wiggle room due to the way things are structured. That being set materials, set upgrade items, that type of stuff, it's very difficult to do that much beyond what the game is going to allow you to do. However, New Game Plus carries over all your progress, makes materials more available, you'll be able to gather more characters that can do more stuff for you, and there can be a bigger focus on combat as New Game Plus also increases the amount of optional battles you'll be able to take part in, which we're about to talk about. Which brings us to the overall gameplay. As I mentioned towards the beginning of the video, the game is very, very story heavy. A first run's probably going to take you like 25 to 40 hours, depending on how quickly you play, and most of that is going to be story scenes where you're just reading dialogue and going through it. In terms of actual fights you're going to be participating into, like maybe a couple dozen, provided you aren't doing too many of the optional battles. The game is mostly narrative scenes, and then this will finally allow you to either explore an area, exploration will allow you to go around gather information that can be useful in persuading people during the voting phases. The voting phases typically combine a little bit of exploration as well as the persuasion together, and you can also find unique stuff during exploration, like items that are hidden away that kind of thing. You can solve the occasional tiny puzzle to get something extra. And then finally, we have the combat phases. Each chapter of the game usually incorporates at least one instance of all of those things. However, some chapters are split up into multiple parts. That said, though, while that is a very linear experience, the game does provide the option to focus more on combat-oriented stuff through mental mock battles. While you're out in the world map, so not actively in a scene, you can bring up the menu and go to your encounter 
encampment. The encampment is where you're going to be accessing your vendors, such as the weapon upgrades, the regular vendor to buy things like consumables to use during combat, as well as the sundry shop, which is where you buy a lot of your more specific upgrade materials from. But there's also a sort of barkeeper. This person will allow you to participate in the mental mock battles, which are where you can grind out experience, items, that type of stuff. But even here, again, the amount of materials you're going to be getting is very, very controlled. But the mental mock battles are helpful because they're going to keep you from getting completely stuck and soft locking yourself. If there is a position where you just can't progress through the main story, you can grind out mental mock battles, which have a set level to them, to get your characters a bit stronger, level them up to where you need them, that kind of thing. But with the way the game handles experience, it's not really possible to get above the level you're supposed to be, if that makes sense. As the second your characters are equal, to or above the level of the enemies you're fighting, they get extremely reduced experience. And that is pretty much the gameplay loop. Now on New Game Plus, we actually get access to harder and harder mental mock battles. They do more stuff, they're more interesting, and you can also dip your way through the various paths of the story. But the mental mock battles are like most of the combat you're going to be participating in if you do more than one run through the story. But now let's actually talk about the combat itself. The combat is kind of where everything starts to make sense in terms of why they structured the game the way that they did. Because the combat is a relatively simple turn-based tactical game. That's not to say it's bad, but it's very run-of-the-mill. If you play a lot of these games, nothing here is going to surprise you, really. But it is pretty well done. Nonetheless, though, turn-based tactical system, it uses a turn order rather than a team system, so your character's speed stat and the enemy's speed stats will determine who gets to go win in the initiative order, basically. Each character can typically move and then take an action. An action can be using a consumable item, a regular standard attack with their weapon, or activating an ability, which requires, of course, the TP points that we talked about earlier. And then you, the character, can also apply the quietuses to the battlefield, However, there are a few mechanics that do make the combat a little more interesting, and this is via the backstab criticals that can happen. So if you hit any character in their back, they take a critical, including your characters. So positioning is important, and at the end of a character's turn, you can decide which way they are facing, which can help you prevent being stabbed in the back yourself. But if a character is flanked, that is to say a character on each side of yours or the enemies, and they get attacked, the other character on the opposite side will also do a follow-up attack, which can be fun, and then there are a few elemental interactions. For instance, some enemies will throw oil at you, or you can get consumable items that will allow you to throw oil. You can then set that oil on fire. You can make puddles that can then be electrocuted. That type of stuff. It's relatively simple, but it can be fun to mess around with the environment a little bit in this way. There are also weather effects that prop up sometimes, though that doesn't happen a ton. So, like I said, if you've played a lot of TRPGs, I don't think the combat will surprise anyone too much, but it is nonetheless a pretty fun, polished experience. However, as I've mentioned, doesn't really open up until you get to the later playthroughs, assuming you get that far. However, once you do get that far, the combat does get pretty easy, as at that point, you'll have so many options available to you that you can pretty easily outdo the enemy, which I imagine is the reason why the experience as a whole is so rigid as you begin the game. But that brings us to our Steam Deck compatibility portion, and to the surprise of no one, it runs very, very well here. So for starters, the game itself has a great on deck rating or it's verified on deck, which generally speaking means that it will work very well right out of the gate without you really needing to do anything to the game. And given the fact that the game started its life on the Nintendo Switch, I don't think it comes as a surprise at all as the format of the hardware is relatively similar. And in some ways, I actually think the game plays a little bit better on the Steam Deck because I think these HD 2D graphics look a little bit better on that smaller screen than they do blown up on my 4K monitor. But if you're thinking about playing this game on the Steam Deck, again, runs very, very well, has a verified rating, you don't really need to do anything, just fire it up and it'll play perfectly for you, and it's a really good experience over there. Now that brings us to our positives and negatives, and then we'll wrap this thing up. So on the positive side of things, I thought all the branching story paths were pretty cool. You don't see a ton of that in tactical RPGs or SRPGs. 
Not to say it doesn't exist, but you don't see it as often as you would in like a traditional RPG. But I enjoyed the story pass. The story itself was very interesting. Seeing it from all these different angles was pretty cool. Which brings me to the next positive, and that is that it's a very polished experience. You can tell they put a lot of effort into this. Everything seems to be really accounted for. All the various story bits react to the choices you've made up to that point. Nothing felt out of place. It's a very polished version of what this kind of game is. Which, on the whole, combined with its relatively easy difficulty compared to many games in this genre, makes it very approachable. If you're looking for a story-heavy RPG that has a little bit of combat and not too much, then this is a great game for you. As a neutral point, but hardly a negative, the art style is definitely not going to be for everybody. This type of art is very polarizing. Some people kind of love it. Other people just hate it. I enjoyed it personally. It kind of reminded me a lot of the older Final Fantasy games that I would play, which I imagine is what they're going for, with a sort of modern twist on it. But nonetheless, there are absolutely people that will not buy this game simply because of the way it looks, so I felt like pointing it out. Now, on the actual negative side of things, I have two here, really. We'll start with the one I didn't really talk about in the review up to this point, and that is that the PC controls are kind of of bad. The game can either use WASD or your mouse. However, while you can use both of those on screen at the same time, the game seems to get very confused when you do this. Like it doesn't know which one it should be taking input from and it can lead to a lot of clunky interactions with the controls as a result. So the PC controls honestly need a little bit of work and I would recommend playing this with a controller if you have one because it does have the support and as someone who plays almost entirely on PC, I can tell you that the controls for this game are not good. But our other probably bigger negative is that the experience at the beginning is a little too restricting, honestly. There's just there's just so many things the game does to kind of keep you walled in that it doesn't really feel like you can do much. And the problem here is that while this game clearly is meant to be enjoyed multiple times, most people are only going to play through this the one time. They're going to remember that kind of, again, walled in experience, and they're not going to think fondly of it, which is a shame because the game gets much better on subsequent playthroughs when those sort of guardrails fall off. Which brings me to my conclusion. Overall, I would tell you Triangle Strategy doesn't really do anything new, but it does do what it does very well. It is incredibly story heavy, and if you're looking for a more combat oriented game, this one's probably not for you. And considering that it is full AAA price, which is $60 US on Steam, a recommendation becomes a bit more of a nuanced thing for me. So on one hand, I think if you plan on playing through this game multiple times and you actually want to see everything the game has to offer, then it does manage to warrant its $60 price tag. I think there's a lot here to enjoy if you're going to play through the game that many times. If you don't want to play through the game that many times and you only want to see it the once, then I would gear yourself up for a very on-the-rails experience that is relatively short, and because of that, I'd catch it on sale if you're not going to play it more than the one time. But for me, though, I did enjoy it for what it was worth. I did actually pay for this game, so I paid the full 60 And given all the time I spent with it, I did enjoy it. I feel like I got my money's worth out of it. But quite frankly, I don't think most people are going to stick around to the later playthroughs where the game really opens up. But that's all I've got for you guys. Certainly hope you enjoyed the review. If you did, like, comment, subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. We are growing every day. The growth over the last month has been tremendous. About 10,000 subscribers in the span of a month, actually. But again, thank you. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.